Our spiritualities will never ever measure up to the holiness of God. However much we stand in the presence of Jesus and we pray during the Eucharist or during the rosaries or even during the chaplet of mercy, our spirituality will never reach the heights of his grace and his holiness. So we are trying constantly. But what is helping us get through is God's mercy. Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Do you believe God is merciful? Okay, I need you to smile if you believe God is merciful. So please don't sit here without smiles. Uh, Please sit here with lots of smiles in your heart. So um, there's a beautiful prayer that St. Faustina makes. Now, we all pray the chaplet of divine mercy. I hear so much of, of testimonies given through the chaplet of divine mercy. But in all of these testimonies that I've heard, it's always been about the testimonies of how God's mercy touched my life how God's mercy touched my family. And so often, this this beautiful devotion of the chaplet of mercy, because the the whole devotion of the chaplet of mercy is actually a very symbolic devotion, starting from the image as well. Everything is very, very symbolic. It is actually giving us an idea of who God is and who we are meant to be when we have that relationship with God. That is the whole idea of the chaplet of divine mercy. So often we turn it into this very very worldly devotion of praying the chaplet of mercy to receive. And it's always about receiving. So even if I'm asking someone else to pray the chaplet of mercy, I tell them, when I prayed the chaplet of mercy, my family came to know peace. You pray the chaplet of mercy. Your family will come to know peace. So it's always a chaplet. It's turning into a chaplet of receiving. A prayer of just receiving. But that is not what the, the devotion of the divine mercy is meant to end up as. The chaplet of divine mercy and the prayer of divine mercy and the whole devotion of divine mercy is about receiving God's mercy so that we can become God's mercy. So it's twofold. It's not just about receiving. It's not just about praying a chaplet and getting a miracle. It's not just about praying a chaplet and getting answers to prayers. But it is about what the chaplet of mercy is making us into, what this devotion is turning us into. All our devotions are meant to be that way. What is it turning us into? Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. 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 When I said you have to smile, I really meant it. You have to smile. You want lunch? You have to smile. (laughs) How many of you are fasting? Can you raise your hands? No one's fasting. So the last time I gave a talk on fasting, and after that suddenly many people wanted to fast. So this time the volunteers told me, Father, maybe we should be careful. Many of them will be fasting. I said, don't worry, they'll forget that talk very soon. (laughs) Perfect prophecy. See, not one person is fasting over here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So if you want your lunch, you better give me my answers and you better have smiles on your faces. Those are the two things I need. I need you to smile. So um, all our devotions are meant for us to grow into something, not just for us to receive things. When we make our devotions, any prayer rather, we may, when we make it into something where it's only about receiving and it's not about turning ourselves into something else, into something beautiful, then the purpose of that prayer and the purpose of that devotion is defeated. When Jesus came into the world, Jesus didn't come only to heal. Isn't that true? Jesus' ministry was not about healing. Now where the Lord is, healings took place. But Jesus' ministry about, was about the kingdom of God. It was about the transformation that he asked people to go through. 
the conversions that he asked people to go through. When the woman was caught in adultery and brought in front of Jesus, everyone else condemned her. Jesus protected her, comforted her, and then the Lord said, go and sin no more. There is transformation. Every experience with Jesus should have a purpose. Coming for the Holy Mass. When you go for Sunday Mass, Sunday Mass is supposed to be an obligation, right? Do you keep your Sunday obligations? Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. I know this is going on camera, but I don't like that term obligation. Because we sit and give. The, the um, uh, drama goes on around here, and we are spectators. And then we walk out feeling that we have finished our obligation. And the question is, what is that mass, what is that Eucharist turned you into? And we think, oh nothing, I finished my obligation. Or you say your rosary. You get through the rosary. It's very difficult in the evenings to get through the rosary, right? It's the one time where the whole family together yawns. <laughs> Isn't that true? Somehow a miracle takes place. It's a miracle of the rosary. Even those people who don't get sleep at night, you start saying the rosary during family prayer. Yeah, there will always be, it's a continuous, it's a continuous yawn that goes. It's like, it's like, you know, I know we don't want to use COVID, but it's something that even is even more effective than COVID by way of how it passes. For centuries, it's been the same. In all families, in all religious communities also, here also. <laughs> Hail Mary, oh, oh grace the Lord is oh. Father Joby, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. So it's, this is something that keeps spreading, right? So you can say your rosaries, you can pray your, your chaplet, but we ask ourselves in all of this, there should be a purpose. There's a purpose in prayer. Just like there was a purpose when Jesus came. Jesus came to prepare people for his his kingdom. And the chaplet of mercy is a preparation. First for us to understand we receive mercy from God. And then we are called to live that mercy out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's a beautiful prayer that St. Faustina makes. And uh, if you go through the diary of St. Faustina, the diary of St. Faustina is based according to paragraphs. So it will all have numbers based on the paragraph. How many of you have read the, cha the diary of St. Faustina? Or you're in the process of reading it. Can you raise your hands? Oh, that's a very poor number. You should. For the, for the chaplets that you've been reciting, you have to, along with that, read the diary. The message is in the diary. The message is not just in the chaplet. There's a message in the, in the picture of the divine mercy. There's a message. Someone actually on Facebook, uh, someone who didn't know about the, about the diary of Saint for, or the picture of the divine mercy actually described it. So I was just going through Facebook today and someone described it as the rainbow Jesus. It's someone who didn't know, but has a great devotion, keeps going. There's, there's the divine mercy, uh, Jesus in their church, and they will go there and, and say their prayers there, but described it as the rainbow Jesus, and that person actually didn't know what this image is. So someone who had put up the Facebook post of the divine mercy, so this person who has seen this has, has responded and said, I wonder what it is called, because I call him the rainbow Jesus. So... This is, this is not just about how, how wonderful he looks in the picture or how beautiful he is or, or, you know, the colorful rays that come out. Everything in the image of mercy actually has a meaning. And that is why when St. Faustina got, the, got the, um, the, the vision of Jesus as the divine mercy and a priest actually got a, a painter to, an artist to actually paint it, after the painting was done, St. Faustina said, I'm not happy. This is not exactly what I saw. And Jesus would say, 
it is not in the color of the paint or in the artist that my message of mercy is, but what it actually means. Even the dark that you see around here, the black actually has a meaning from the darkness of, of life, from the darkness of the world, coming forth Jesus in his divine mercy. The rays have meaning to it. So I'm not going to speak about the image of mercy. Maybe next time when we will do a retreat, a residential retreat, when our residential block will finally get completed one fine day, we are hoping in Sri Lanka things happen very, very slowly. So we are learning lots of patience. Jesus sent Father Joby and me over here to learn patience. <laughs> so um, first he sent Father Augustine to learn patience and then sent him back after he studied it. So. Um, when we learn patience, you send us back also. So uh, we are waiting for that residential block to get done. We are waiting and waiting and waiting very patiently. So um, um, maybe we will describe the image of mercy at, uh, during one of those divine mercy retreats that we'll have a residential retreat. But everything in this picture actually has, even the gaze of Jesus. The Lord says, it is my gaze from the cross. Everything in that has a message. The rays Jesus describes and says, these are the rays of water that purify and the blood that cleanses. And anyone who comes under the umbrella of these ga this gaze will always be protected in my mercy. It has a meaning. It's not just a pretty picture. And so in the same way, the chaplet of mercy is not just a very beautiful prayer. The devotion of the divine mercy is not just a beautiful prayer. It is a transformation. We who receive God's mercy are called to live God's mercy. Uh, so in the diary of St. Faustina, so I started out by saying that you're supposed to be reading. So now... You, you, you can get PDF versions of this in, or online as well. So if you don't want to buy the book, you can get a PDF version as well online. But it's beautiful. When you're saying the chaplet of mercy, read at least one paragraph. Just one paragraph. That's so small. One paragraph. Just read it. But it's so beautiful to enrich ourselves with what God's mercy is and who we are called to be as well. In 163 of... Um, of the notebook of, of St. Faustina. This is what she says. O most holy trinity, as many times as I breathe, as many times as my heart beats, as many times as my blood pulsates through my body, so many thousand times do I want to glorify your mercy. So not only just receiving your mercy, but I want to I want to glorify your mercy. So how do I glorify your mercy? I want to be completely transformed into your mercy. I want to become your mercy. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm sure that, that we, we, we don't get usually such a big crowd. So the crowd numbers have been increasing it for the past few, few months. We've always had those canopies outside. Now we used to have four. Now we have six of them. So uh, now the next ones, we don't know where to place them. Uh, <laughs> we'll hopefully have to place them there. But maybe now because it's the Feast of Divine Mercy as well and, and uh, everyone thinks, okay, when we come to Divine and we are the Feast of the Divine Mercy, I'm sure you are hoping that God's mercy will touch you and your family. Yes or no? Yes. That is the hope with which you came here, right? Yes. But that is only part of the process. It's only part of the process. So you cannot go back from here thinking to yourself, I have been touched by God's mercy. The prayer always is, let me become your mercy. Let me become your mercy. I want to be completely transformed into your mercy and to be your living reflection. O oh Lord, May the greatest of all divine attributes, that of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul into my neighbor. I 
cannot keep that mercy within me. I cannot hold God's mercy within me. How does God describe his mercy? He says, my mercy is unfathomable. What does it mean, unfathomable? What? Lunch, lunch. You want lunch? (laughs) What does unfathomable mean? You cannot fathom, you cannot even imagine. We cannot imagine his mercy. And that is why the Lord says, you will never be able to reach the depths of my mercy. You will not be able to know how deep my mercy is. You cannot fathom my mercy. And this is where she says, out of all your divine attributes of your unfathomable mercy, pass through my heart and soul into my neighbor. Because in my heart, I cannot hold all of God's mercy. I have to keep letting it flow through. I have to keep letting it flow through. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I've been going on these, these days. I was going on, on trips. I'd been to uh, Malaysia. I'd been to uh, Mumbai as well. So uh, when I went over there, uh, people were very kind. Just letting you know. There's a difference. People were very kind. You know, lots of chocolates came inside. Lots of, uh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Please don't bring anything here. All of us in that house are skipping meals, not because we are fasting, because we are trying to lose some of this heaviness. We've seen cracks in that uh, building. <laughs> and the cracks have all come after Father Joby has reached. No, no, that's not true. (laughs) The cracks actually started after I came. (laughs) So one year ago, the cracks started. Now Now we started to believe that maybe the cracks are because of us. So all of us are busy exercising. So don't take what I said seriously. It is, it is banned over here. But so I've been going around to these places and they would, um, they would keep coming with all this stuff and, and my bag is small. And then I'm trying to stuff it in. I'm trying to stuff it in. And, and the more I'm trying to stuff in it, I know the zip cannot actually close. And you know, you're pressing it, you're pushing it and trying to, I don't know, those chocolates must have become nice, uh, you know, chocolate shakes and things like that. So all pressed, but I'm trying to push it in. And then you reach a point where you realize you've got to take this off and give it to someone (laughs) instead of trying to stuff it all into your bag. Don't try to stuff all of God's mercy into yourself. It's unfathomable. It will not remain within you. It is meant to be given out. And how do we give it out? There's this beautiful prayer of St. Faustina that I've fallen in love with. And it's a prayer that um, I I make. It's a prayer that uh, I don't know if I'm keeping very well, but it's a prayer that I make. But I hope that you you will also hold on to this prayer. So she continues in 163 of, uh, of her notebook. She continues and she says, after saying that, Let your unfathomable mercy pass through my heart and soul into my neighbor. And then she describes how that happens. Help me, O Lord, that my eyes may be merciful. Help me, O Lord, that my eyes may be merciful, so that I may never suspect or judge from appearances, but look for what is beautiful in my neighbor's soul and come to their rescue." Help me that my eyes may be merciful so that my eyes do not judge. So often the first point of judgment is always the eyes. Often. Of course, you can judge from your ears also if you don't get to see the person. But um, when most probably our judgment starts from the moment we set eyes. The judgment can be good or bad. So you can look at someone who you like a lot and you can look at a person's face that is nice and beautiful, handsome, pretty or kind. Or you can look at a person who was born with a face that didn't seem very kind. And the moment we see it, we think, 
about judging them. Our eyes are always the first point of judgment. And this is where she prays and she says, Oh Lord, let my eyes be, let my eyes be merciful. And it's maybe something we need to actually ask ourselves, how merciful are our eyes? Wherever we are, how merciful are our eyes? Even when maybe we are sitting in a church and we know about someone, we know what kind of people they are, or maybe we know something about their life. And the moment they come and sit, our eyes have already judged. You could be at work and your eyes have already judged. So what is the use of receiving mercy when my eye itself cannot be merciful? While when we, when we pray to the Lord and we ask the Lord and Jesus looks at us, he sees us, he's seen everything about us. Yes or no? Yes. yes. We might look perfect and good and extremely holy in church. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe in your parish, you are that prominent person or you're always kneeling and you're praying and there are people who look at you and look at your family and they say, I hope our family was like this. But then maybe when you're going for confession to your parish priest and your parish priest wants to make out, is this the same person? But that is how we are. When we are in the presence of God, when God looks at us, he sees everything. He sees beyond. He sees beyond this cassock. He sees beyond this toll. He sees beyond the priesthood. He sees beyond my preaching. He sees beyond my, my, my holiness that maybe I am making myself out to be or you are making me out to be. He sees beyond that. And I am hoping that when the Lord looks and he sees beyond all the mask that I've put up, he will be merciful. I'm hoping that even in my weakness, my Lord will be merciful, that he will look at me with mercy. In that case, when I look at my brother, my sister, when I look at someone else who is not living a good life, when I look at someone else who's not very popular, when I look at someone else who maybe I, don't, I dislike and I don't agree with, Lord, let my eyes be merciful. Because the eye, as Jesus says, is the lamp of the body. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, the body is full of light. If the eye is merciful, the body will be full of mercy. Maybe it's good to ask ourselves and see, what do our eyes actually see? How do our eyes actually look? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I remember I was once in, um, when I was in school, I think it was when I was in fourth standard or fifth standard or something, but I was in completing my homework and uh, it was social studies. Do you have a subject called social studies? Okay, yes, you have that. So it was social studies and I, I was in, in Dubai in the school over there and um, I wasn't completing my homework. The first day the teacher came and she asked about the homework, I hadn't done it. The second day I hadn't done it. The third day I hadn't done it. And you know teachers, any teachers over here? Any teachers? All the teachers, can you raise your hands? Okay. You know, teachers, you should always give grace marks and pass your children. <laughs> Some of them may end up becoming priests. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, this social science teacher, the social studies teacher, she was so frustrated with me because every time she walked into class and she'll take the book, it's still incomplete. And she was so angry. She told me, the rest of the day, you're going to sit in the staff room and complete all the work. Now that was horrible. Sitting amongst all those teachers, a fifth standard student, 
you know, sitting inside over there and completing. The problem is not completing the work. Every time these teachers walk into the staff room, they are going to see this kid over there. And they're going to ask, so why are you here? I didn't finish my homework. <laughs> and then she'll be sitting over there and then she'll give the rest because I'm saying only the little, I didn't finish my homework. And she'll say, not for one day, for two weeks. <laughs> and so when I was sitting over there, every teacher that came in, when they walked in, I would look at their eyes. And I'm hoping, I mean, at, the, at that time, I am unthinking of the particular term merciful, but in my heart, I'm hoping that they will look at me with mercy. <laughs> and there are a few teachers who sat around who would say, you know, let him go. The first period finished, the second period finished, the third period finished, and we had eight periods, you know, eight hours. And, uh, and each one, all those seven hours after her class, she made me sit in that staff room. And I'm looking, each teacher will come in and I'm hoping they'll have some mercy on me. <laughs> and in between, some of the teachers would say, let him go now. And she would say, nothing doing, he will sit over there. <laughs> now, when we come into the presence of the Lord, we are hoping for that same mercy, isn't it? According to the lives that we've led and all the secret pocket areas of filth that we have in our life, we are still looking at Jesus and we are hoping, Lord, you will look at me with mercy. Then the Lord asks us, your eyes, does it look at others with mercy? If you want my eyes to look at you with mercy, does your eyes look with mercy? You know, there's this beautiful incident that takes place in John chapter 6, John chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, when, when Jesus touches the blind man and heals him. And Jesus, what does he do to heal him? Lunch, lunch, what does he do to heal him? <laughs> Jesus is merciful. I'm not very merciful here. <laughs> no, no, no. He puts his spittle on the ground, makes a paste out of it, and he applies it. How many of you have any kind of eye problems? You have spex, eye problems, raise your hands. Come to me after the session. There's some nice mud over there. I've got lots of spittle. <laughs> you okay with that? Uh, not okay with that. Who wants your hospital? But I'm always, I always think, you know, that man is so blessed, right? The spittle of Jesus touched his eyes. Oh Lord, the spittle of your mercy, let it touch my eyes. So that I will see with your mercy. I will look with your mercy. That is the transformation of divine mercy. When I start now looking like Jesus sees. I see as Jesus sees. So that's what she says first. Lord, let my eyes be merciful. Then she continues to say, Lord, help me that my ears may be merciful. So that I may give heed to my neighbor's needs and not be indifferent to their pains and mournings. Lord, let my ears be merciful so that I may give heed to my neighbor's needs and not be indifferent to their, so that I might not be indifferent to their pains or their moanings. Hallelujah. 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 There is always a cry. Now we, when we offer our cry unto the Lord, when we cry out to Jesus, the Lord is listening. His ears are open. The scripture tells us beautifully, you call and I will answer you. It is so comforting to know that I can call and the Lord will answer. He will hear. When blind man Bartimaeus screamed out and everyone else didn't want to hear him. But Jesus heard his voice and Jesus says, call him here. Jesus hears his voice. When we pray, that is our hope, isn't it? When you pray the chaplet of mercy, what is your hope? That only Father Michael will hear or your next door neighbor will hear. Is that what your hope is? You're not bothered if we will hear. 
but you're bothered if the Lord hears. So I have this habit when I pray the chaplet of mercy, I will extend my hand. I just learned it from when I was in the seminary and I used to go to one of our retreat centers and there I saw the priests extending their hands in the, in the position of the passion and, uh, and praying it. So even, even I, I do it as well. And somewhere within it, you know, uh, there's something that's not very, not very good, but somewhere within it, I'm actually trying to tell the Lord, Lord, listen to me. See, I'm I'm even taking that pain. Listen to me. Because my pain is there on my body as well. Lord, listen to me. If it helps, so oh Jesus, that you hear me, maybe I'll even raise and stand on one leg. But we would do that, don't we? For the Lord to hear us, what all we do. We will go many a mile. This place is not very close to Colombo. How many of you from Colombo, can you raise your hands? Okay, this place is not very close to Colombo and still you will come. Why? Because somewhere we believe, if I make that journey, when we go for a pilgrimage, how many of you during these times, you've, you've been to um, Madhu during these times, you know, this uh, Lenten season and all. Okay, good. So we go there, we, make, we believe that when we go there, that whole journey is a process of prayer. Somewhere we believe the Lord is listening. When I make that effort, when I say that prayer, the Lord is opening his ears and the Lord is listening. And the Lord says, well, I listen to you with ears that are merciful. But will your ears be merciful to hear the moaning and the pain and the groaning of those who are around you? Not the ones who love you. It's very easy to hear the voice of the one who loves you. If Father Michael is sick and I cough so often, I'm scared to cough nowadays. Because when I cough, I will get at least 20 different types of medications. One will come from one set of people who come for the retreat. Then another will come with one set of my volunteers and team members. They will bring another set. Then instead of lunch and dinner, I just have to eat all these things. It's very easy to hear when your loved ones moan and groan. But that is not the prayer that St. Faustina makes. Faustina's prayer is, let me give heed to my neighbor's needs and not be indifferent to their pain or their suffering. I want them, let me, let me have a year that needs to listen to them. A year that is open enough a year that is big enough, not just here, a year that is big enough from my heart that I can listen to them, what they need, what they desire, what they require. Let me have a year that is open enough. I was traveling uh, recently, I don't know, I think it was from, from Malaysia that I was traveling on the flight back and they served the meals and when they served the meals uh, along with the meals, they, they asked what I wanted to drink, I asked for a Pepsi and so they put it in the glass, you know that plastic glass, those flimsy glasses, they put it and they, they put it over there, unlucky for me, the, the um, what do you call that? The tray. The, the tray had two portions to it. So some of them have one full tray. Some of them have this foldable trays. So it was folded and I opened it out and I took the Pepsi and put it on this side of the, the tray because that is where that little holder that, you know, it's not even a holder. It's just a uh, depression in the bay of uh, whatever, <laughs> the bay of that tray. And, and I put it over there and for my luck, it wasn't straight. So it's nicely tilted and the whole thing fell onto me. Now when the whole thing fell onto me, I was, hoping, I was happy because there was a bit of the pillow that was there that was on my lap. So this thing has fallen on and then I can feel, because it's nice and chilled, I can feel it all coming through my pants. So I'm now going, oh, oh, it's fallen, it's fallen. And I'm hoping that this Eros just, is going to actually help me. She turns a deaf ear because her work is come and give me the food. How you eat it is your problem. <laughs> so now she's serving the others and I'm trying to gather attention. She is deaf. And then I'm hoping the person next to me will help. Honestly, I have no clue how they're going to help me. 
because I have to help myself and clean it up. But I'm hoping maybe he will be concerned. And he has seen this fall, and he adjusts his earphones better and starts looking right into the screen. And he doesn't take his out, eyes off the screen, and his, the spoon is going right from down. If I had put a stone there, maybe even that would have gone into his mouth. But he's not taking his eyes away from the screen. Because if he takes his eyes away, he has to see me. So he's looking over there, his earphones all fixed, while I'm busy trying to mop up all my mess. Well, don't worry, we are just the same. When we know someone is in need, and our ears choose to put a headphones onto it. I don't want to hear. Why do you think your children put on earphones all the time? <laughs> they don't want to hear you. That's why the younger generation actually have that. They and their world. And so often, we and our world. This is where St. Faustina says, Lord, let my, let my ears be merciful. It's good to ask ourselves, are our ears actually merciful? In Psalm 40, verse 6, Psalm 40, verse 6, the word says, My ears have been opened. My ears have been opened. How important it is for us to pray every day, Lord, open my ears that I might hear someone in need, that I might hear someone who's desperate, someone who's mourning, someone who's crying. Someone who is crying, but is not, it is not translating into maybe a language, but they are crying. Lord, open my ears that I might hear them. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 So many people were healed of their deafness when Jesus touched them. We should pray, Lord, heal the deafness of my indifference to others. Lord, heal the deafness of my indifference to others. She continues in a prayer. So the first is, Lord, let my eyes be merciful. Let my ears be merciful. And then she says, help me, Lord, that my tongue may be merciful so that I should never speak negatively of my neighbor but have a word of comfort and forgiveness for all. Praise the Lord. Praise Lord. Lord, let my tongue be merciful. How important. Our tongue can be so destructive. I gave a talk recently in Mumbai about, about how we convey and what we speak. So I don't know if you have heard it, so I'm not repeating myself. But, um, but it's so important. Our tongue to be merciful. When Jesus, even without saying a word, when the woman who was caught in adultery and brought in front of her and they were all speaking with their tongues of condemnation, Jesus kept drawing on the ground, right? What was Jesus drawing? What was Jesus drawing? I can't hear you. Tell me, what was Jesus drawing? Tell me, names, sins? Ah, very good. No one knows. If he knew, they would have put it in the scriptures if it was something. He was drawing. We have no clue what he was drawing. But then words came out. Let anyone without sin cast the first stone. That tongue to defend the defenseless. She was defenseless because she was in sin. She lived a sinful life. And she was defenseless. She was caught in the very act of adultery. She was defenseless. Them condemning her was not surprising. The law would say it is okay and fine. But when he opened his mouth, when from his tongue words came out, it was words of mercy. For her, it was words of mercy. It was words of hope. How do we use our tongue? We pray the chaplet of mercy, and with the same tongue that we pray the chaplet of mercy. How do we use that tongue? Whose hearts do we pierce? Whose ears do we cut? 
Whose lives do we destroy? With the very same, with the very same tongue that we pray the chaplet of mercy, even more, the very same tongue that we receive Jesus with. Recently, I was for for Holy Week. I was in uh, I was in Hyderabad, in my brother's place, because you Sri Lankans don't give me visas. Um, <laughs> I will keep putting that to you till you give me my visa. Praise God. <laughs> no worry, I'm on a visit visa here. <laughs> but um, so I was, I was over there and I was, uh, uh, I was at the service. I was giving the Good Friday homely in there, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in his parish, in my brother's, uh, where my brother goes to. And I was talking about the relic of the cross. In our, in our retreat center in Divine, in Porta, we have the relic of the cross of Christ. And um, every, it's not put out for public uh, reverence or veneration, but during uh, Holy Week on Good Friday, if any of you have been there for Holy Week on Good Friday, you would have got to kiss the relic. That relic is there. And, uh, and so I was giving them a, a little homely about uh, about the relic and how I was holding it. So uh, I was holding it in my first year as a priest. I was holding it as people came and kissed it. And so after, uh, after the whole homely and everything, after that, uh, after that Good Friday service finished, a uh, very elderly auntie came up to me and she told me, please let me kiss your hands. Those are the hands that held the cross of Christ. And no one's asked me to kiss my hands because I held that, that little thing. But I, I started thinking, you know, far more real is the Holy Eucharist that touches our tongue. Then what comes forth from our tongue after that? We have touched the body and blood of Christ on our tongue, then what comes forth after that? What comes forth from our lips? How many people are we destroying? How many people are we rude to? How many people do we hurt? with the same sacred body and blood of Jesus that we believe will heal us. So when I receive Jesus in Holy Communion, I believe the Lord is healing me spiritually and physically. And yet, with this tongue, I go and cut, I go and wound. No wonder she says so beautifully, Help me, Lord, that my tongue may be merciful. Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, Death or life is in the power of our tongue. We can either kill or we can build. Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise you, Jesus. The next one. Help me, Lord, that my tongue may be merciful. Then she goes on to say, Help me, Lord, that my hands may be merciful and filled with good deeds so that I may do only good to my neighbors and take upon myself the more difficult and toilsome tasks. Praise the Lord. Lord, let my, let my hands be merciful that it might reach out with mercy. We are hoping in every service, we are hoping that God in his mercy will touch us. Not touch us with judgment, but touch us with mercy. Then the Lord said, if I touch you with mercy, let your hands be merciful, that it reaches out to help others with, with mercy. There's a, there's, there's a beautiful thing about, about Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene carries... No, 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 no. Simon of Cyrene carries whose cross? Someone else's cross. So Jesus tells us, you carry your cross and follow me. 
Mercy involves not only carrying your cross and following him, but if my brother, my sister needs me to carry their cross, I will extend my hands to help them carry the cross. It's not my cross. It is theirs. Maybe they deserve it. Maybe they have to carry it. I can have all those attitudes where I say, let them carry their own cross. Let them carry their own burdens. Let them carry their own struggles. But what the Lord tells us is, through that, that act of Simon, I was, I was at that parish and I was telling them as well, you know, in the stations of the cross, I find it very, uh, very amusing when we very reverentially during the stations of the cross, we say, it is obviously a prayer written by whoever has written it, but uh, we say, Lord, I will not be like Simon who reluctantly carried the cross. I will joyfully carry the cross for you. What nonsense. <laughs> it is not true. We don't even carry our crosses decently. But maybe the Lord says, well, Simon carried mine. Will you carry someone else's? Let your hands be merciful enough to reach out. One thing beautiful I loved about, about what happened during, during the time when we struggled over here with the fuel crisis and all the financial crisis, it's still going on, but um, especially the fuel crisis, you had people standing in queue in front of those, those petrol bunks. And what was beautiful was people who had petrol with them, who had fuel in their cars, would still come and feed people who were standing in those queues. It's their cross, but yet I can reach out. How much am I reaching out? How much are my hands becoming merciful? Praise the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. 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 And then she completes it by saying, help me, Lord, that my feet may become merciful so that I may hurry to assist my neighbor overcoming my own fatigue and my own weariness. When I am weak, let my, let my feet be merciful enough to be able to go out of the way, to be able to reach out and to touch. You know, something I, I, I don't know if he's here, I hope he's not here, but uh, <laughs> something I, I've been with Father Joby when I was in the retreat center in Sydney, that was his first overseas, uh, uh, first overseas trip he actually came to, he was there for around, we were together for I think around two, two years, I'm presuming, around two years, and, um, and then even over here. But one thing that I've always seen about him, he can be exhausted. And then you tell him, you know, Father Joby, can you just do that bit? And you can see he's exhausted. And he'll still say, okay, fine, I'll do it. Never, ever have I heard him when he's exhausted tell me. <laughs> Let him hear at least one good thing I said about him. Because last night I was having a call to somebody from Australia and I was roasting him. He was, <laughs> he was actually listening to the whole thing. I was having a good, good go at him. But, um, but it's, what's the truth is the truth. And I've never heard him say no. He could be extremely tired, but he'll push himself for that last bit. I think something that we need to learn let my feet be merciful. It's hard. And that is what, that is what uh, the Lord tells as well. Towards the end, he says, I know it is hard for you to do this, but with my mercy, it will be possible, says the Lord. We're not doing it of our own accord. But with my mercy, it will become possible. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. And then she ends it with the words, Lord, let my heart be merciful so that I myself may feel all the sufferings of my neighbor. I will refuse my heart to no one. 
I will be sincere even with those who I know will abuse my kindness. That is where we always stop, don't we? We always stop and we think someone's going to abuse my kindness. But look at her prayer. A person who's so immersed in the Lord's mercy, even when I know they are going to abuse my kindness, oh Lord, let my heart not stop being merciful. Because that's exactly what we do with the Lord. Even though he knows that we will abuse his kindness, he continues to be merciful. From here, you can't get this book. We don't have, I don't think we have brought down the book, but I think uh, Pauline Publications might have it. I don't know if they have it over here, but uh, you will, you will uh, be able to find the Diary of St. Faustina in most of the religious places. You should be able to find this. Or you would be able to get it. If you don't get it now, uh, you're not able to. Till a time when we are able to bring it down, uh, you can get it online as well. Or even if you go through the app, of Divine Mercy app on your phones, you will get some of these messages that are there. But please do, um, please do use it. Please do pray with it. Don't just pray the chaplet without making it a, se a selfish prayer where it's just about what I need. No, the prayer of the Divine Mercy and the whole devotion of the Divine Mercy is a devotion that helps us turn ourselves into another Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Let us all stand. Let's close eyes. Lord, as we celebrate your greatest act of mercy in the Eucharist, we pray, O oh Jesus, that we who receive your mercy may start experiencing that mercy to such depths that we become your mercy to all those around us even if they take our kindness for granted Lord Jesus give us a heart that is so filled with your mercy that we will be happy to share your mercy with others touch our hearts so merciful Jesus that we might be messengers of mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.